You may not think much of it, but your grandparents certainly valued ice highly. Getting those refreshing little cubes was a lot of work a hundred years ago. It's times like these that I am amazed at how quickly things evolve. But let's start at the beginning. In ancient times, there were different ways to keep food at temperatures lower than the surrounding environment. One method was to submerge the fruit or food container in a stream or well with fresh water. The Egyptians used a very interesting method to keep food fresh. They placed food inside large clay pots that were wetted on the outside and constantly fanned, using the evaporation of water to lower the temperature. The same process was used in this antique milk cooler. The pores of the clay pot remain moist due to the capillary effect of the water, and the evaporation lowers the internal temperature. The privileged who lived near frozen mountains could enjoy a cold drink or even preserve food using natural ice obtained from the mountaintops. This was something that the more affluent families of ancient Rome or China, for example, could enjoy. In Persia, there was the Yakchal, an ice house developed over 2,400 years ago. It was an ingenious design that used natural ventilation and thermal insulation techniques to store ice collected in the winter and preserve it until summer. During the winter, water was channeled to an external reservoir where it would freeze during the cold nights, producing ice. Since colder air descends, the collected ice was stored at the bottom of the reservoir, which was below ground level. Additionally, the conical shape with a hole in the middle of the roof allowed outside air to circulate through the structure and be channeled upward, carrying away the warm air that accumulated at the top. This is how the Persians ensured their summer cold drinks. Over time, in Western countries, a very useful utensil called the ice box emerged, made of wood and metal, allowing food to be preserved by placing a large block of ice inside, delivered by a professional known as the ice man. And look, they understood basic physics. The ice was placed at the top because warm air rises and cold air descends, right? But getting back to the ice man, he leads us to a very interesting story about the lucrative ice business that made the North American Frederick Tudor much richer and earned him the title of the Ice King. Many people have no idea about this, but between 1806 and 1920, millions of people worldwide obtained ice from ships leaving Boston in the United States. This lake, for example, was a major ice producer. In 1806, Frederick Tudor realized that most ships leaving the busy port of Boston were sailing empty to fetch goods from around the world. Actually, they weren't completely empty. To improve the stability of the ships, the holds were filled with stones to increase the ballast weight. Tudor also noticed something that he had in abundance, and, at the same time, had no value in its current location, but was non-existent in the hot places where many of those ships docked. Ice. It didn't take long for him to connect the dots and see that he was facing a situation of cheap product, cheap transport, and high demand, as he could replace the stones carried in the bottoms of the ships with hundreds of blocks of ice. Of course, most people didn't believe ice could be transported very far, but it was. After a few attempts, Tudor developed a process to ship numerous blocks of ice wrapped in sawdust, which is a great thermal insulator and had long been used to store ice in the coldest places or near frozen mountains, an approach that allowed Boston ice to reach places like New Orleans, Havana in Cuba, Pernambuco and Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, Bombay in India, Australia, Hong Kong, and many other locations. Voila! A global multi-million dollar ice trade was established, employing thousands of people as early as 1830. People who worked cutting ice on lakes, transporting it to ships, storing it, and shipping it around the world. A trade that had almost zero environmental impact since it used ice that formed naturally on the northern lakes and transported it to hot places using wind-powered sailboats. But human ingenuity would soon surpass Mother Nature's ability, and all these people would be out of work. In fact, the machine that would end the Ice King's business was already in development even before he started his global business in 1806. In 1755 in Scotland, William Cullen had already produced ice in his laboratory using ether, which is an anesthetic. What he did was place the ether in a closed container and remove the air, creating a negative pressure, a partial vacuum. This reduced the boiling point of the liquid and caused it to evaporate rapidly absorbing heat and forming ice crystals on the outside of the container. A simple experiment that laid the foundation for subsequent inventors to develop their machines. 
In 1805, the American Oliver Evans was the first to describe vapor compression refrigeration and propose a theoretical design for the first refrigerator, identifying all the main components. But it would take three decades before someone could build a practical example. In 1818, the American inventor Jacob Perkins, who lived in England, met the inventor Oliver Evans, who explained his ideas about a refrigeration machine. Based on this knowledge, Perkins designed and patented his own version of an ice-making machine in England in 1834. The machine employed an innovative closed-cycle vapor compression system, which would become the secret behind the operation of refrigerators. It was also a prototype not intended for domestic use, as it used hazardous substances like ether and ammonia in the cooling process, and it never went beyond the prototype phase as Perkins passed away in 1849. Another inventor who used Oliver Evans' ideas on this subject was the American physician John Gorey. A specialist in tropical diseases, he used basins filled with ice obtained from the Ice King to cool the rooms of his yellow fever patients in Florida. Something very expensive and unfeasible, as you can imagine. A situation that led Gorey to research artificial ice production. In 1841, he began working on a machine that used the compression and rapid expansion of air in a coil submerged in a tank with salt water to produce brick-sized ice blocks by 1850. In 1851, it became the first patent for such a machine in the United States. Impoverished from abandoning his medical career to focus on the invention, Gorey spent the next four years trying to raise funds to finance the commercial production of the machine. He also spent four years being ridiculed and humiliated by public criticism, supposedly financed by Frederick Tudor, the Ice King, and by religious groups, who at the time considered ice a creation of God and not a domain of humans. Gorey died poor and alone in 1855. Around the same time in Australia, the inventor James Harrison also designed and built a machine that used ether and a compressor driven by a steam engine to produce ice as early as 1851. The machine was refined, patented, and used to establish the first commercially viable artificial ice business in 1854, capable of producing three tons of ice blocks per day. Since Australia was very far from the United States and Norway, where natural ice was extracted, Harrison's ice ended up being competitive. Until the early 1910s, ice machines were extremely large, steam-powered or combustion engine driven, and designed to make ice on an industrial scale. Here, for example, is a portable ice factory used by the American Red Cross. The first relevant electric refrigerator for domestic use would not be invented until 1913. The Domelre was developed by the American Fred William Wolfe and even sold a few hundred units. However, it was an unattractive and expensive appliance for the broader public, with much room for improvement, right? In 1918, William Durant, co-founder of General Motors, bought a small refrigerator company and founded the Frigidaire Company, which began mass production of domestic refrigerators. However, production was still quite small. The situation began to change with the launch of the General Electric Monitor Top Refrigerator in 1927. Considered the first affordable refrigerator for the middle class and truly mass-produced in the United States. Its distinctive feature was its compressor, located at the top, resembling the gun turret of the USS Monitor, hence the name. A feature that would change at the end of the 1930s, with compressor parts being placed at the bottom of the refrigerator. Despite being innovative and functional, this model still didn't drive sales as expected. In 1930, only 10% of households in the United States had a refrigerator at home. The main reason that still held back sales of these appliances, aside from the price, of course, was the toxic products used in the refrigerant liquid, which often leaked and caused fatalities. A fact that even in 1930 kept the natural ice industry alive. This only changed when the American companies DuPont and Frigidaire of General Motors joined forces to develop the famous Freon gas in 1929 which was less dangerous for humans, odorless, and non-flammable, but which decades later was discovered to be extremely destructive to the ozone layer. Despite this, Freon gas removed the last obstacle for refrigerator sales to skyrocket worldwide. As more homes gained access to electricity since this was also the time of electrical system implementation in much of the world, more and more people acquired beautiful and elegant refrigerators, reducing food waste and intestinal problems. To give you an idea, the evolution in the United States went from 10% of households with a refrigerator in 1930 to 56% in 1940 and 80% in 1951. But after all, how does a refrigerator work? 
Well, first it's interesting to understand what temperature, pressure, volume, and heat are. This will be a very basic explanation, just to understand the functioning of the refrigerator. Let's take for example this container containing an ideal gas. The temperature of this gas is a measure of the average kinetic energy of its particles, or basically the average speed of these particles. They are always in motion. The difference is that warmer particles move more than colder ones. Pressure is the amount of force per unit area applied perpendicularly to the surface of the container when these particles collide with the sides. And the volume is the space occupied by them. If you increase the temperature of this container, which cannot vary its volume, like in a pressure cooker, the internal pressure will increase because the level of agitation of the particles will increase and consequently, the collisions with the walls. If the container is cooled, the pressure will decrease along with the drop in temperature. This relation also happens if the variation is in pressure. If it increases, the temperature increases. If the pressure decreases, the temperature decreases. But what is heat? Well, heat is the amount of energy transferred from the hot container to the cold container until they reach the same temperature, at which point there will be no more heat transfer. Another important point for understanding how the refrigerator works is to be aware that when a liquid evaporates and turns into a gas, it absorbs a quantity of heat, and when the gas condenses and returns to a liquid state, it releases a quantity of heat. This is fundamental to understanding the operation of the refrigeration machine. By the way, this is how our body's cooling system works. When we sweat, the body releases heat to the environment through the evaporation of sweat. Since to evaporate, sweat absorbs heat from the body. And when a cold drink gets wet on the outside, it is because it absorbs heat from the water vapor in the environment, which condenses into small water droplets. That means your drink is getting warmer. Returning to the refrigerator, imagine it as a machine that pumps heat from inside a thermal box to the outside using a heat pump. Basically, a refrigerant liquid absorbs heat from the food, evaporates, and carries the heat to the outside of the refrigerator where it returns to a liquid state and releases the heat into the environment. But how does your refrigerator do this? Essentially, it uses five main components to cool your drink. The compressor, the condenser coil, the expansion valve, the evaporator coil, and the refrigerant liquid. When the refrigerant liquid passes through the expander, it experiences a sudden pressure drop, which also suddenly decreases its temperature. Next, the extremely cold, Low pressure liquid flows through the evaporator coil inside the refrigerator, absorbing heat from the food and increasing its temperature until it evaporates, turning into a gas, at which point it absorbs even more heat. Next, this gas moves towards the compressor, which increases its pressure and consequently, its temperature even more. Now, a very hot high pressure gas flows through the condenser coil exposed to the ambient temperature, which is much lower compared to the gas temperature. At this point, heat is released into the atmosphere, decreasing the temperature of this high pressure gas, which condenses back into a liquid, releasing even more heat before heading toward the expander to repeat the cycle. As for the refrigerant liquid used in this process, it is currently called 1,1.2 tetrafluoroethane, an HFC refrigerant that boils at a temperature of minus 26 degrees Celsius at atmospheric pressure, transforming from liquid to gas. Remember that water boils at 100 degrees. This HFC refrigerant replaced the CFC R12, also called Freon-12, a substance that, as you already know, damages the ozone layer. Well, now that I know how much work it used to take to get a few ice cubes, I think I'll go have a cold drink. By the way, what's your favorite cold drink? Thank you for your company, and until next time,